you're not selling AI to anyone. You're selling a value proposition that has to do with making their business better. And the question is, how are you making their business better? And how would you say those stories, right? And so very early on, we ended up building very strong product marketing, storytelling capabilities in the company. This is Siddhar Talwalia. Welcome to the 100x Entrepreneur Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Prime Venture Partners, an early stage VC fund led by Amit Somani, Shripati Acharya and Sanjay Swami. Prime is often the first institutional investor in category creating tech startups in fintech, SaaS, healthcare and education such as MyGate, Quizzes, Mfine. To know more about Prime, visit primevp.in. Today I have with me Ashwini Ashokan, founder and chief executive officer of Mad Street 10, an AI and computer vision startup based out of Chennai. Ashwini returned to India from US after more than a decade to bootstrap Mad Street 10, which she founded with her husband Anand Chandrasekharan in 2013. She is an alumnus of Carnegie Mellon University Pennsylvania and she graduated with a master's degree in product design. She went on to work with Intel in California where she led a team working on improving the user experience for mobile products welcome ashwini to the podcast thanks for having me sadat ashwini i have summarized your journey but would love to know from you you know you were an aspiring dancer then you know a product designer and now one of the most revered ai entrepreneurs in india how how does this journey happen what was serendipity the role of you know intention luck <laughs> <laughs> okay so you know i still remember being in um high school and uh, and undergrad and and swearing that i was not going to get into any computer related fields <laughs> so and also any uh you know basic sciences and hardcore academic related fields because i come from a family of um, really really highly accomplished um folks like my brother is a director of the gene therapy institute at duke in the us he's a professor my husband is a neuroscientist my sister in laws are physicists and uh, toxicologists so they, i come from a family of either professors or just like hardcore geeks and computer scientists right this is this is my family and uh, the minute i decided i was going to be a dancer it was uh, you know everybody was like fine i think you know the personality lent itself very well to the creative fields more than anything else um i definitely was a bit of a rebel growing up um and and just refused to kind of uh, do what everybody else was doing and and had very 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 supportive family as well that was kind of nurturing of whatever i wanted to do um undergrad because i wanted to sustain my dance um, and music um, um careers i decided i would just go and do my you know uh, undergrad in visual communication which is again kind of the creative arts and creative design and um, you know all of that kind of changed when i met anand and uh, he went to the us to pursue his phd in neuroscience and uh, i decided to kind of pretty much abandon everything i was doing here in india and follow him to the us and so my degree in carnegie mellon was almost a function of me trying to go be in the, be right next to anan rather than uh you know a journey that was uh, all about me uh, you know trying to create a career for myself in product design or or design or ai or anything for that matter um but carnegie mellon definitely changed a lot of things for me i think my it pretty much set the path for the next chapter in my life and i fell in love with the idea of product design product development um to the role of technology i mean cmu is really really well known for robotics and hci and uh, you know i spent much of my work with the, you know i did a lot of work with the robotics um, uh, team with the hci team and uh, when i graduated again almost all my peers ended up going to you know your google twitter your classic kind of your ideo design classic kind of spaces that people were going but something very interesting happened to me in that intel was hiring um you know uh, uh intel was basically trying to become a platform company in the early 2000s and they were hiring people from all different types of fields right and i mean you know anthropologists designers hci people ai people machine learning your your computer uh, your vision uh, image processing nlp all kinds of people to kind of come and help 
you know, bootstrap a lot of their different types of efforts to becoming that platform company. And I had this opportunity to work with, you know, hundreds of people during that period, a very, very multidisciplinary organization. And that journey of 10 years at Intel and my mentors there, I would argue, pretty much gave me the blueprint for the kind of startup that uh, I wanted to have. And, uh, you know, during my course at Intel, I think, you know, Anand and I already had started talking for years before, you know, we actually decided to leave California about the kind of company we would do and, you know, the the kind of uh, the reason why we would build these companies, so on and so forth. And, you know, 2012, 2013, we found a very opportunistic time when Anand had finished his postdoc at Stanford and he was kind of consulting for a little bit. He chose not to become a professor. And we were just kind of preparing in some ways for just like starting this company. And uh, we just decided something just hit us. And, you know, we just decided we were going to move to India. We made the decision. And in about three, four days, we moved to India. Um, it was very abrupt, right? And But that's broadly how Anand and I function. We're very, very um, impulsive people. And once we make a decision, we kind of see it through. Um, and so we came back to India to start this company. And... What really drove us to start this company was, you know, we were surrounded in a world, and I don't think a lot of this is strange to date, by the way, but we were living in a world where, you know, people are building AI for the sake of, uh, for the sake of the technology, pushing the boundaries on the underlying technology, the infrastructure, the hardware, the software, and there was entirely the human component of AI was entirely missing in the in the conversation, right? And that had been something that. Um, I had been kind of uh, harping about for years that, you know, trying to find meaningful applications of AI that can change both industry as well as consumer lifestyle in a meaningful way. We still don't have too many of those. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where I would say we just took it upon ourselves to say we are going to um, go and figure this out. We don't know how and why. We had some hypotheses about how we wanted to do it. We wanted to build a, you know, we want to start off by building an AI platform. Um, and we wanted to build the platform in a way that was, you know, very directed towards meaningful applications. We had a couple of ideas about verticals. And so we kind of, it was a fairly blind jump. Um, and and it's almost exactly like Reid Hoffman says, you know, we jumped and then we figured out how to put that parachute together or that plane together so that we could land uh, fairly smoothly. And that pretty much uh, summarizes my journey. So it was a bit, of luck, it was a bit of serendipity. It was a bit of just being, uh, I think, you know, a, a constantly someone who was um, open to new experiences. I never limited myself to one thing. I was constantly learning something new. I can tell you, my twenties were completely um, a journey of just discovering new things, taking new paths. You know, being a designer for a couple of years, being an anthropologist for a couple of years, an ethnographer. Being a you know product developer, program manager, I took on many, many different hats because it allowed me to learn several different aspects of the business. So you could almost say that my 10 years, my decade plus at Intel was kind of like an apprenticeship getting me ready for this journey. So yeah. What an amazing journey you have had, Ashwini. And it's an amazing combo of co-founders. You have you know expertise in human-centered design and Anand has a expertise in artificial intelligence. And you both combine it together to build AI, which is more human in nature. So, so tell us more about the problems you are solving currently and at what scale are you solving? So today we've got in the company, we've got, um, you know, we are well known for our first vertical, Bureau AI. Um, Bureau AI was actually launched a few years after we started the company. The first couple of years of the company, we were pretty much building out our platform, right? We were building out the underlying pieces of technology, um, our vision stack, our, our uh, language-based, uh, our NLP stack, our, um, you know, uh, basically system architecture, putting the different pieces together, doing a lot of experiments to see if the underlying tech itself was usable, workable. Um, I think was pretty much what we were doing for about two two years or so. And then it was only at the end of it that we said, okay, let's launch this vertical. The business part of it actually started only after we had spent a bit of time building out um, the core components because, you know, especially in the space of AI, um, we were strong believers that picking up off-the-shelf components was not necessarily very helpful all the time because, you know, they're built for scale, for generic problems. They don't necessarily solve specific problems very well. And I'm talking 2014, 15, right, time frame. 
And so in 2016, we decided we were going to double down with the retail uh, segment and we launched View.ai, right? Um, and we decided this would be the first vertical and we would first solve for this and learn how to build these applications, learn how to sell AI, learn how to go to market with AI, how to say these types of stories, demonstrate value. And, and, and then we would kind of go into subsequent verticals like, you know, uh, any of the other verticals that, that, that uh, are out there, whether it's education or healthcare or whatever else it is. So I would say 2016 end to 2020 now, over three and a half years roughly has been completely focused on, uh, you know, um, the Bureau.ai retail vertical. And now we're at that point where things are looking great. Um, and, you know, the company has had a fairly um, rapid growth and the Bureau.ai vertical as well. And uh, we are starting to very quietly, slowly start moving into adjacent verticals, um, which is a story for another day. And... Uh... You know, you have some fantastic retail customers like Tata, Mercado, Libre, and Macy's. How did you acquire such big clients? See, the, the number one thing that I tell almost everybody that I typically work with or people that I talk to is, you know, AI is, what is AI? AI is basically the, you know, anything to do with AI is about data, right? Yeah. It's about fixing, cleaning data. It's about using data in a way that it can actually add value to a business in some form or it's using data to uh, provide a fantastic customer experience or using it. So it's, it's all purpose driven, right? The AI part is almost, you know, it's taken me a few years to kind of get to this point where like half, half the companies or people around the world don't care. You have an AI enabled phone. So what? Right? Nobody cares. But if you have something that's going to take a picture of you 10 times, your selfie is like 100 times better than it ever will be. Or, you know, if you can use automated stickers of and like your Snapchats and your Instagrams of the world where you have all of these, uh, you know, filters and stuff that can allow you to mess with them and play with them and all the ARs. That is what people care about. People don't care that there's AI in your phone, right? Yep. Um, and for us, I would say it's broadly been that same kind of philosophy, right? Where... Um, and we've built almost all of our business stories around this, which is like, you know, you're not selling AI to anyone. You're selling a value proposition that has to do with making their business better. And the question is, how are you making their business better? And how would you say those stories, right? And so very early on, we ended up building very strong product marketing, storytelling capabilities in the company that allow us to not just go to someone and say, oh, I have a piece of AI. And it's almost always met with, so what? Right. So does 100 people. So do 100 people out there. And um, I think for us, it was very different. So we, we really focused on um, storytelling more than anything else and showing value ROI, very, very ROI driven AI and products. Right. So but in terms of acquiring these customers, itself, you know, there's a saying in Tamil, um, which is if you're a young kind of, uh, you know, cow, like a calf or an animal. Uh, you know no, no fear, right? Because you know no better. Um, and you just kind of go and do it because you've never been told that it's wrong or it's inappropriate or whatever. And I would say for us in the early days of View.ai, we just like called people or mailed them or messaged them directly and, and just kind of, you know, got in their way and said, hey, just give me five minutes or 10 minutes and kind of really took the time to start networking with people and then got people to connect us, you know, and, and kind of brute force, right? That journey from zero to one million was 100% brute force, right? And, uh, you know, there's something about uh, the lack of experience, which is just so, uh, you have no baggage, right? And as you continue to grow in your journey, you pick up a lot of baggage along the way and you start questioning yourself, doubting yourself, asking the same question 100 times. You don't have a lot of that when you're starting the company. And I'd say, you know, for us, we were just, we knew exactly what we wanted. We knew the kind of companies we wanted. We spent a lot of time really identifying just who we wanted to go behind, why, and just kind of went at them, right, with the stories. And uh, it worked. I mean, you know, it's not like everybody just opened the door and said, yes, sure, come take whatever you want. For us, it was about doing those early POCs and during doing uh, while we were doing those POCs, you know, demonstrating the success metrics, showing that this has value and then getting them to sign those massive contracts. Right. So these were all journeys that we've gone through over the period of time. And having some early wins is always a fantastic way to kind of fuel growth. Right. And so we ended up spending some time and this is where your Sequoia, Infinity, your board, right, becomes very, very helpful because these are people that, they didn't just, they brought, you know, their network to the table as well, you know, and we had fantastic mentors who kind of, you know, um, helped us during that process. And so 
early days of growth and gtm were just like a combination of just blindly jumping in and some help with uh, you know from people that in the network so yeah so so right, as of today you know you advise mentors on gtm what was your thoughts on gtm when you started let's say, let's take the first journey from 0 to 1 million dollar arr did you like focus on us india or it was a how how did you build that team to go from 0 to 1 million arr yeah there was you know 0 to 1 million arr was me <laughs> and then me yeah. and the boss right so the first 10 people were basically 0 to 1 million arr and yeah. and you know i don't think i knew what gtm was i don't think i knew what you know customer success was um all of those things now i know as terms and phrases and we kind of retrofitted them we now but but we were doing all of this without even knowing what, that we were all yeah. doing it right so some of it is just so for us it was i mean enterprise sales you're talking about few hundred thousand dollars yes. for for contracts these are not your small 5000 10000 dollar deals yeah. and so they're very very elaborate deals because um yeah that's the nature of the product and um, obviously you know um um i think obviously it 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 required a lot of brute force mailing people calling people getting to that uh, and getting in touch with the right people and you know I, that journey was not i would say it was very chaotic we didn't necessarily know what we were doing we we barely spent we didn't do any we didn't spend any money on marketing by the way in those days right like no money at all this was just email linkedin calls you know calling people who knew people and just kind of you know getting getting folks to sign up and come and talk to us so i would say gtm for us was very very people driven in the early days of course it looks very different today and when i mentor but it's very different right today i have um a lot of startups you know early founder early stage founders talking to me and you know i know better now right and so for me like you know i always tell people make sure you have a product marketing person on day zero right especially if you're a deep tech company especially if you're a b2b saas company you really have to talk about the value of your product from a perspective of roi and what meaning it has to to have for the person on the other side and why they should care and those stories are not always very easily said by you know not everybody always has that um, skill set and so having a group of people who can or even one person right who can write those emails who can work with you um it really really matters a lot right um and it also matters because as you grow your team you've got that original group of 10 people who have helped you say these stories who can continue to grow and nurture the rest of their teams right so today you know i swear by the first uh, 10 20 people that who are still there with us many of whom are still there and they still continue to play this very very catalytic role in the company of growing the company right they like how do you spread that culture four years five years six years seven years after the company has been around we're almost 250 today and uh, across multiple geographies as a company we're in japan we're in the us we're in latam india middle east then people from very different backgrounds cultures who are also not sitting in the same place it's important you have a group of people that are constantly you know doing the rounds um continuing to nurture those skill sets and those stories and so it's not just a function externally in the early days i think that lot that you end up hiring you know for the first year first two years become very important in kind of spreading those stories over time as well even inside the company so you know today i tell people you know make sure you have a product marketer everybody wants to hire your guy who's going to go spend your money on google ads but what are you spending the ads on yeah. right like having the right people with you who can really really you know put together those case studies in those early days you know really work with analysts in the early days these are all things in hindsight i wish i'd done but uh, you know we have a really really incredible team today which i'm super proud of so you know better late than never and were your first 10 customers more from us or india which geography were they from so for us it was all mainly the us it was not india we did before we launched bureau ai we worked pretty extensively in india while we were building out the underlying tech yeah but uh, you know this is 2013 14 and nobody in india was paying for b2b tech at that point especially enterprise deals like deep tech like ours and uh, very quickly we kind of you know honed our products honed our underlying tech and then we kind of launched in the us so you know all of our work the 0 to 1 mil journey which lasted about 12 months yeah so we went within 12 months we went from 0 to 1 uh, for bureau ai and that journey almost completely happened in the us fantastic so it must have involved you and anand spending a lot of time there or it was from india it was a bit of both i would say we definitely flew in once every 2 months or so to the us and uh, 
you know we still have our house there and stuff like that and yeah. you know, so we we were able to kind of set up two bases and go back and forth quite a bit but uh, it was a bit of both it was not like we needed to be there all the time uh we were able to the question is how much of that upfront you know ground work are you able to do there in person right go there for 3 days 4 days really bond with the people there come back continue the work do the poc and then go back 2 months later to show the poc right and then come back and then you know work on the contract and do the rest of it and remotely right so and the same 10 20 people were you know your customer success your delivery your product your uh, uh analytics and engagement uh, focused folks so they were the same 20 people that wore all those hats right in the early days and uh, yeah and uh, i believe you are talking about 2014 2015 it must have been really hard to hire ai talent in india no much to the contrary actually my trip back to india was pretty much uh, uh, it happened because of the talent i came yeah. back home chennai i love to say is a university town <laughs> which is yeah. funny because it is obviously it has more than 10 million people it's obviously not a town but it just has so many universities such fantastic talent and for me to be able to come back home was uh, I, that was one of the main reasons i came back home um it because precisely because of the talent right you're not going to compete with a google in the valley you are absolutely yeah. not going to be able to compete without you know 10 times 20 times the the capital that you get to raise in india right so yeah. very different dynamics and and you have an you have amazing talent pool here so you know i think if anything the story of max sweden is a story of its talent and its team like i can i can say that 100% right like finding these people here and this the team is what makes this company special um and the talent here and the skills here is what really makes the company very very special and they come in they train for years and we've continued to grow the leadership the people that have been with us from day zero make them managers groom the next group right so we've kind of been able to create this kind of you know a really well put together but also a continuous process it's not a one time thing you can't do this once and just stop right you got to keep nurturing it with the teams have to keep growing um and 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 you know you encounter different kinds of problems 0 to 1 is very different problems than 1 to 10 right yeah um and uh, yeah so it's it's i would say this is the place for talent <laughs> india is the place for talent i think every founder who wants to build anything this is the place i mean india is definitely the place so if anything i think it's the other way around fantastic and you credit all the the success of mad street then to the talent that you could attract and help grow along the journey absolutely absolutely right i think uh, think of we we think of this journey that we're on as a journey where uh, there are no paths you know how many ai first uh, saas companies have been there out there in the world right that have succeeded or that have made it or that have models for growth not really uh, not really at all and uh, so we understand that these are you know first time journeys nobody's built a path that everybody knows uh, we're figuring it out which means it requires a very particular kind of skill set that is extremely talented but is also willing to suspend disbelief right and is able to experiment is able to go where we need to go work against all odds and you have to believe that it's possible and uh, so absolutely it's completely a product of the team and when when was your first us hire in this journey uh so one of our co-founders has been in the us from the get go um yeah. so, but then i think our but i mean it wasn't we didn't grow a team or anything until 20 Yeah, I think 2016 we launched, and 2017 was our first hire. And it definitely would have been, you know, growing the sales team uh, there in US. No, it's a bit of both again. I mean, you'd think yeah. that you you would think that, but no, I think it's a, it's always been a mix of, uh, you know, a handful of people in the US and uh, you know, uh, quite a big team sitting out of India. I mean, you know, you'd be surprised, especially now. I mean, and of course, in the early days, it was very different. because you still needed physical presence and people to go show up and so we always had a couple of people in the US but um, you know there are a lot there's a lot of sale especially today right like boundaries mean nothing right being in a different country means absolutely nothing everybody is on the call right and so we have people in india who are trained enough to do deals across the globe so it's been it's been a bit of a mix right like the teams just work together constantly work together while the sales team they're all sitting in the some of the uh, members are sitting in the us all our solution engineers and sales engineers are all sitting in india right 
So it has always been a bit of a tag team uh, across global. And uh, the model has really worked out. I mean, you're, I think place as a limitation now more than ever before has just disappeared. Yeah, in, in times of COVID, yeah. all physical boundaries have dissolved. Absolutely. Ashwini, uh, you mentioned in one of your interviews that you didn't want to raise funds as the startup was bootstrapped, profitable. When did you decide and why did you decide to raise funds from VCs? I think... It was one of those journeys where we hadn't really planned for a VC raise or anything. We had come back. Yeah. We were building our own thing. Um, but, you know, Sequoia being Sequoia <laughs> found us before anybody found us. We had yeah. registered the company and they already found us. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, people came, people spoke and, you know, Xfinity, GrowX, they were all part of our early journey and, yeah. You know, really early believers in the company and the deep tech. We didn't even have a product. We didn't have a vertical. We didn't have a business, nothing. And, they, you know, and so I'd say funding happened to us. We didn't really go out there and raise funding. And, uh, you know, um, a, a lot of them also ended up being a lot of customers to us, right? Saying, okay, go experiment with this. Like, here's a gaming yeah. company. Here's a healthcare company. Here's a retail company. And a lot of inbound kind of interest and connections to people. And as we started experimenting and trying to understand where we wanted to take our platform, we said, okay, you know, we'll just open up and go ahead. So very different than what it looks like today, right? Our seed funding happened in very, very different circumstances to people who were in a very different frame of mind, I'd argue, yeah. than uh, the way seed funding or, you know, businesses become. I feel like it's become much more cut, copy, paste today. Like you have an idea, you pitch an early idea, you go to one of these accelerator programs, or, yeah. you know, you, it's, it's very prescribed, I think, today. It wasn't the case in early days when we had come back and and um, and we were also definitely, you know, clueless at people that had never worked in the startup community or even in India for that matter. It was definitely a bit of a, you know, we left the country when we were 18, 19, 20 in some form and, and uh, you know, coming back with children and stuff was just very different experience for us completely. And so it took us a little while to get adjusted to everything going on here and settle down and, and you know, um, get the business going. But yeah, we had some very, very helpful people during that process who were guiding us every step of the way. And I keep telling people, right, having the right kind of mentors around you is so important, so important. And today... There are so many founders who've already made it second time, third time founders, investors who've been investing for over a decade now. The talent pool in India also on the founder and investment side is so much more mature it was than it was say in the early 2010, 2013, that kind of time frame, right? And uh, there's a lot of people out there who have really done it, not just people who are claiming to be mentors and startup thought leaders, right? I'm not talking yeah. about those people. I'm talking about people who've actually been there, done that. And who can truly provide help. And I constantly tell anyone that comes, you know, and talks to me about this stuff. is just like surround yourself with the right kind of people who can kind of remove roadblocks for you, right? Or can help you show show you your blind spots and, and stuff like that as you grow in the early stage. So Ashwini, would love to know from you, your journey from 1 mil ARR to 10 mil ARR. What kind of processes you, you built in the company to reach that milestone? So my, the 1 to 10 mil journey is completely been about people process more than anything else right the company's dna is definitely tech driven product yeah and uh, that is something we seem to continue to do at an insane speed like we are at this point in the company's journey where products are released there's not enough gtm people to actually go create gtm for the features like the, the stuff that gets released in the company that's the speed at which we build our stuff and deliver to customers so that our dna over there is just top notch um, but we've spent a lot of time in that one to 10 journey, really, really being focused on people and process, right? So hiring the right kind of managers, hiring the right kind of leadership team. Um, we don't do this whole people manager thing at MSD at all. We only do people who are very actively producers of whatever, you know, and are responsible as independent contributors as well, right? And they're all technical leaders in some form, right? Regardless of the, of the, feel they're in, whether it's marketing or sales or customer success or, um, you know, um, uh, AI or delivery or engineering or whatever it is, whichever field it is, you have to be an expert in that field, owning a chunk of the work by yourself, right? And, and you know, it, it's a way for us to kind of continue to nurture that, you know, this is not just someone who's managing a bunch of people, but it's someone who's actually 
setting the strategy, very actively responsible for, you know, uh, doing a lot of the things as well. And so for us, it's really been about getting really good talent. But we've also grown a lot of talent internally. I'd say the majority of the leadership team we have today were, are all, were all ingrown, like completely, you know, um, grown from within the company. And uh, this is definitely something that I know Anand and I are incredibly proud of. Um, we've spent the last five years or so working to kind of grow the right teams, make sure the foundation is right, uh, have a really strong scaffolding for nurturing that kind of growth. And I think we're there, right? Like, And that has been one of the top needs in this journey to make sure that the scaffolding is super strong. Um, and I think we're there, right? Like, and, and with most of the talent just having come from inside the company itself. And for some, for some of those roles that were entirely missing, we had to go find people from outside and bring them in um, more recently. That's the first thing. The second thing has been, uh, you know, figuring out how to step back. I think as um, someone who's been doing the sales, I've been doing a lot of the sales myself, the marketing, the product, the customer engagements. These are all things, you know, as a founder in the early stage, you do everything yourself, right? And when you bring a team in, it's a bit of a shock that you have to even step back. And this is one of those things my... Board constantly tells me, step back, let them do it. Step back, let them do it. And and that has been another really important thing, right? Making sure that the system is sustainable and is, is moving at the pace at which it moved when, you know, let's say Anand and I or, and Costa and a handful of others were kind of, you know, um, doing a bunch of things, right? And and that's the second kind of goal that I've, I've been focused on is building an organization, not just the leadership and the management and and the managers and, and grooming people, but also making sure that the processes in place are, are, are fantastic, right? And where they don't, where, the, where people come in and, you know, as you continue to grow to a thousand people, you know, people just know there are processes in place, there's documentation in place, there's things that are set in their ways. And, and so that's been a really important focus as well. Which kind of brings me to the third thing, which is a bit contrarian to one and two that yeah. I just discussed, which is, you know, Knowledge that's constantly in a tribal group, like just just, just tribal knowledge, right, yeah. like, uh, is, 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 is also detrimental to growth. But too much process is also detrimental to growth, right, because it becomes very red tape at that point, right? Everything is bureaucratic. You can't move. Like, you know, everything needs time. Everybody needs a meeting. And so that's, that's the third point. I think we've tried to set up a lot of autonomous systems inside the company that can move very quickly right like just just move quickly like there's no need to wait there's no need to kind of you know call 10 meetings and but at the same time communicate right over communicate make sure everybody who's responsible or is a stakeholder is aware that you're moving this fast so that they can look at it and if they have issues or objections or something to add to it they can add right so these are all things that i think we've been working very very hard at um in that in that kind of window and um you know i think um I'm feeling very good about it. I mean, and there's a lot of friction as well, right? As you start to build people from different cultures that speak different languages in your, you know, and, and th those kind of milestones start to happen. You know, again, there are lots of friction over there. And, and, and so, you know, making sure that the team is able to work together as one unit, but also have the autonomy to work in terms of small autonomous units that are highly highly driven i think kind of balancing those two has been very important and almost i would say the primary kind of you know um foundation of sorts that has uh, that that is that that i believe is going to be helpful as we march to this 100 mil goal you know we are i'm looking forward to the the large milestone of 100 mil arr by Matt street 10 the... <laughs> me too obviously me too but... you know it would be india's first AI startup to reach that milestone and only one of the few uh, you know SaaS focused companies and and I hope uh, in the in the next few years there are companies who have crossed that milestone or their at milestone are going public so definitely I have my fingers crossed uh, you know to see Matt Street then public in in the coming years right uh, you you have built the company so much right way right you are the first AI startup with 50% women. The time you emphasize on doing a uh, building the right culture and also speaking about it in, in the right forums is phenomenal, Ashwini. But Ashwini, tell me one thing, you know, which if you go back in time, one thing which you would have changed, what would that thing be? If I would change one thing, what would that be? 
That's a really good question. And I'm not sure I have an answer for that. You know, I'm one of those people who is, uh, who's often blamed for uh, being too um, positive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too, um, especially in recent times, I think I've had yeah. my share of uh, ranting and stuff, but I do tend to kind of be very optimistic about everything. And when I look back, you know, I want to say no regret. I really do. You know, there are lots of mistakes that, you know, we've made and there are lots of, you know, things that could have gone better and, you know, we could have done so many things for faster growth, better, you know, but I but I think it's it's no regrets. And, and if I had to go back and do a couple of things and, and, and I would say hiring and firing faster, like that's the one yeah. thing that comes to me over and over again, right? Like, I think I've definitely delayed both some, you know, very important hires as well as firing. And I would say if I had to go back and do it, I would probably have fired the people I, I let go of much faster than I did um, and hired their replacements much faster than I did. So I think that that is something that I, I constantly think back to. And I know that it's it's one of those things that follows me to a lot of places. So so I'll probably leave you with that answer. And, you know, just to the SaaS founders who are early stage listening to this podcast, what would be some of the other mistakes which you did or which you advise other SaaS founders to just avoid in their journey to, you know, let's say a mill or a 10 mil ARR that you know, don't do these things. They would delay you back a couple of years. Um, I think this is the phase where you continuously iterate. I, I, you know, I think if I had to equate building a startup till that, that, that kind of a 10 mil milestone, it's really all yeah. about, it's almost like building a product. You've got to iterate. You've got to have your scrums. You've got to have your monthly releases. Yeah. You've got to have your right hires to make that happen. And and I often look at organization building itself as product building and think of it as a very similar parallels. Or um, and I think you know not getting too stuck on one thing. It's important to have strong principles, foundations. Uh, you know thoughts on how things should and shouldn't be done. But I think a lot changed. There are so many variables, right? Like so many variables while you're building a business and anything can change. Your market can change overnight. Your customer can go bankrupt overnight. Your, your, you know, there's so many things that can get out of control, I think. And so in a way, you're optimizing continuously for those variables to make sure that you're not dropping the ball on one thing, Right. So you always have to react, but at the same time, you have to march towards a long-term goal, right? And I think balancing between con- reacting to something happening around you versus like keeping your eyes on that, you know, end goal, I think is really hard. And I think uh, that is something that people like, there is, nothing is too holy in that zero to 10 end phase, right? The idea is to cross that and you have to do whatever it takes to cross that. And whenever somebody puts you in a box, for me, I would say the biggest lesson has been breaking the box I put myself into more than anything else. Um, I constantly created boxes for myself. It's so funny because I've, I've been, my career is nothing, of, um, you know, if, if anything is, is, is the exact opposite of me putting myself in a box. And yet this journey from zero to 10, it was always, you know, so much peer pressure, so much going on around you, so much, there's always something better. There's, it, it's very hard. I think the stress is insanely high. And I would say today, with this quarantine, to be honest with you, I'm in a great place in the sense that I've kind of withdrawn from a lot of the noise um, and really learned to focus on the signals that matter. And uh, I would say that's important in that journey, just like the other point I made. I would say focus. Like, it doesn't matter what who raised what. It doesn't matter what other people are doing. It doesn't matter what anyone else has to say about you. The only thing that matters is what your customers have to say about you. Nothing else matters, right? And And being able to deliver at the kind of speed that you need to to grow your business really fast is all that really matters and 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 find that from within as opposed to kind of constantly having to benchmark yourself against everybody else toshwini in this last 7 years of uh, mastery 10 what have you learned to let go that last point right that that last point i would say is definitely what it is and i think you know i would say this journey is more like three and a half, four years old, really. Yeah. It's not seven. I mean, I came back to the country seven years ago. The first year yeah. I spent just adjusting to my life back. <laughs> the second year we registered the company. 
Yeah. The third year, we decided we'll build a platform in the tech, and it was only, but it was easily like year four. By the time we kind of, you know, decided, okay, we're gonna launch Vero AI. So I think this journey is more like about three and a half, four years old than than older. And I would say, during that period for me, this last thing that I told you is probably the most important takeaway, right? Like, don't put yourself in a box. And I think I worked myself out of that box I put myself in, right? I didn't start my journey putting myself in a box, putting myself in a category, and expecting to be you know perform a certain way i think the internet is filled with hundreds of ways everybody has a, a say opinion about how you need to do your gtm how you need to build your product how you need to build your team everybody has an opinion right and i think as a founder you intuitively know a lot of these things right and you can read it's important to read it's like a book right it's important to read it's important to learn but the circumstances that each of us are in is very different right and i think each of us need to find a way to make it and and each of our definition of success is different and uh, you know i i know my ambition and my my need to run i was always running faster in my head than i my body was actually able to follow to be honest with you right uh, i was always 3 years ahead and it was frustrating not to be able to catch up to where my head was right and uh, i think that actually hurt me more than it helped me and uh, and today i mean and roy from sequoia has been like this this kind of i don't know i don't know what i would have done if i didn't have him so make sure that every one of you has someone to call at 12 o'clock at night um <laughs> someone who can who can be this coach who can who can get you in the right frame of mind who can get you exactly where you need to go when you go off off you know the track i think it's very important someone who can show you a mirror so that you're continuing to better yourself and ashwini you know uh, any books which have been really helpful in this journey um you know i read a lot of books especially lately i've been reading all kinds of books and i think uh, i'm not going to give you one book that's just yeah. something that you know but i think all of your usual suspects i'm not going to talk about your zero to one or like yes. the hard things about that i'm not going i'm going to skip all of that right and yeah. i'm going to say you know i've started reading more biographies um um you know um i've been reading a lot about the intel four founders i've been reading a lot about um um on simplicity um this book by edward de bono that i've been reading a lot about just the idea of what it means for for you to embrace simplicity in your process right and not complicate everything um there's another book um uh, by richard thara called uh, misbehaving um so i think i've lately been reading more and more books about um personality and and traits and human behavior and little lesser and lesser about you know your how to get your start up to 10 million how to get 10 million from zero to i've had enough of that i've just had enough yeah. of that i'm i'm just totally done with that 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 you know i'm just done with that genre of startup books for i think i've had enough of it and so i think uh, you know it's messed with me if anything so i'm i'm going to actively tell everybody listening to this podcast just stay away from that crap like you're going to find your journey when you're in doubt you know read a couple of blog posts that tell you to fix a very specific problem that you have you know there are lots of people that speak truth to their journeys go understand that right you're going to figure it out if if you're if you're willing and if you're driven to make your company happen you're going to figure it out the one point i really appreciate which you put it that entrepreneurs or you know people in general also put themselves in so many boxes for example let's take a journey of a saas entrepreneur so he would say hey ashwini you did your 0 to 1 mil in uh, one year uh, you know it's been 3 years for me but i have not reached that milestone but it's it's so much subjective you know it's all it's about the domain which you are putting in it's ab- about how much time has gone in preparation for that like you mentioned it was approximately 3 to 4 years that you put in so you are consider the msd journey from 2016 17 and not from 2013 when you came to india right so so we so really appreciate you you putting forward that was because we are trying to fix you know as a solution as a society or as a ecosystem and startup everything into boxes hey your 0 to 1 million should be in is x amount of years 1 to 10 should be in x amount of years if not you are not doing something right no and i think those guidelines are i think they're helpful right like for me the way i think about it is the minute we launched vue.ai 
first yeah. 12 months for us going from 0 to 1 mil the minute we figured that part of it out we're going to do it was important for us but yeah. that's different right but for us the the journey prior to that we hadn't even raised money we were fully yes. strapped and we were building our tech we came to india saying we are going to build our infrastructure and our platform and our tech and make it proprietary and and we didn't compromise on that at all right like we refused to start the business side of things until we actually got and and to date i'll tell you sure we could have cut down a a year here a few months here yeah. stuff like that but today the scale, the the pace at which we are able to scale our platform into other verticals even quietly at the speed it should be it's because we put in that time right early on and and we did it on our own terms and i think it's it's, it's so yeah i think you know you just have to decide because i mean vcs at the end of the day are in the business of making money and yeah. way, you know, so if you're taking vc money you better behave by the rules of the business, <laughs> right um and if you want to be bootstrapped and you don't want to be you know bothered by anyone no worries at all that's a path as well but i feel like this whole like there's no one way there's no one way so so you don't believe in you know your zero to one should be in so much amount of time when you talk to the your mentees or one to 10 in so much amount of time with so many resources no i i tell them that if they're going to go raise a seed round of like 1 and 1/2 million 2 million 3 million and if they're yeah. going to go make a pitch then you are bound by it like you decided to go what you decided to go a certain way right and it might not always happen the point is you are not it might not always happen and, and when you have the right kind of board they understand no one's going to like screw you over within like you know the first and not give you a chance at survival i don't think that's that's the case at all there especially now more than ever before india my god everybody who's anybody is raising money at insane prices so if anything yeah. i think it's a founder market right now it's absolutely a founder market right now so you know some of the stuff that you know you typically went through the early 2010s or late 2000s i think you don't see much of that anymore i'd argue right um and and it is a founder market so but but if you do end up taking vc money and you have a plan and blah 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 you can't be pudging around right there's also that side of it right so yep. know why you're starting the company and starting the company even without i mean the number of proposals i get like even with before the company started you're like oh i'm i'm going for you know i'm going i'm going to raise money and you're like Do you even have a business proposal? What are you raising money for, right? Like I, I encounter that a lot. So I just think that you know, we see no, we see decide what your goal is. You need to have a goal. You need to be otherwise, your there's no company. Company is meaningless otherwise. So Ashwini, I didn't it ask it earlier in the podcast, but I want to ask right now. Why did you started MSD, and has that why changed over a period of time? Ah, uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. Um. Anand and I are on a thirty-year journey, twenty-five, thirty-year journey. Um, we believe our road uh, leads to a lot of places. Um, we have a vision for where we want to be uh, tens of years uh, in the future, um, and this is just you know a first step towards that. And uh, why we started MSB, I would say you know I am one of those people that truly believes that. it is important for as much of the world to participate in creating ai and being ai literate and being ai native and i think msd is a journey for me in building really really large scale businesses that actively employ and empower people into becoming part of this ai ecosystem and why is ai ecosystem important to you That's right your education has been different your background has been different from that because i see the world in the future being completely ai filled and i think if we all don't figure out how to get people to be a part of that ai future then you're just going to be you know having a handful of people who are going to be dictating what you consume what you do everything is going to be dictated by a handful of people right and in order to make the future much more equitable it's important more and more people are part of that and are getting ready for it right now right now right um and if if and it's absolutely and and i believe that industry and large scale industry is one way to continue to get people into that ai economy right and to me msd is absolutely a a an endeavor towards that um and not only do we skill people grow with people here inside the company we're also able to bring these kinds of tools and productivity tools and ai based systems to people in other companies and our customers who are able to work with it and everybody is kind of i think 
it's a both an inside MSD team's perspective, but also inside customer orgs and their team's perspective. I think it's just a, it's it's an effort to get everybody part of that AI community or that AI future. And that to me is, um, you know, MSD is a way for me to make that happen. And scale is extremely important because it's not enough uh, if a handful of people are part of that. For me, it's a really, really large scale industry that I hope to build. Um, over tens of years with, with a lot of lot of people that can be a part of that. Thank you so much, Ashwini, for your wisdom, insights, and experience that you shared on the podcast. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Siddharth.